Hi, this is Dr. Dearden and I'm doing a review for Unit 4 of Physical Science 100. I hope this will help you to prepare for the Unit 4 exam that's uh, coming up shortly. So let's dive into it. First, a little bit of information about the exam. Uh, as the other exams, this one will be 30 multiple choice questions. It'll be available in the testing center both in Salt Lake and in Provo on Monday the 6th of April and must be completed by close of the testing center on Friday the 10th of April. Keep in mind that Friday hours are different from hours during the week. As long as we're talking about exams, I might as well also mention the final exam, which is required for Physical Science 100 to pass the course. So you must take the final exam. The final exam consists of a hundred multiple choice questions like the ones that you've seen on the prior exams. You have an option to have your entire grade based on the final exam score or it can be weighted uh, with the other exams. Whichever gives you the highest grade is what you'll get. Um, and so I hope that gives you an incentive to work hard on the final because even if you have bombed everything, you can still get an A if you do well on the final. The final will be available also both in Salt Lake and in Provo, but it's, if it's in Provo, uh, don't go to the normal Heber J. Grant Testing Center. Um, Salt Lake Center classes will have their finals in the conference building, uh, which is uh, the mirror walled building over towards the MTC, rooms 2265 through 2267. I hope that's right about the the, that building. I think that's the right one. Anyway, the final has to be done by the close of the testing center on Tuesday the 21st of April. Note that that's not the last day of finals. We have a slightly early closing date for this. Um, finally, I encourage you to do the course evaluations. It helps me, if you do those, to become a better teacher. And so I, I value that. You do those online and uh, you get one quiz credit for doing it. Uh, it's not much, but it's better than nothing. All right, important concepts that we covered in Unit 4. First, we started off talking about geology. So uh, we talked about different techniques for measuring the relative ages of rocks. We'll review those in just a second. We also talked about how you measure the absolute closure ages of rocks, or how long it's been since the rock cooled uh, above its closure temp or cool below its closure temperature. We talked about different layers that make up the interior of the earth and they can be classified in different ways. Mechanically you can classify them one way that is uh, according to you know cold crustal material on the outside and then warmer plasticky asthenosphere type material inside and then you know a solid mantle and uh, then a liquid uh, iron core. We can also talk about the chemical classification, which is where you classify the layers according to what kind of rock they are. You know, uh, outermost layer is uh, granites and basalts, and then the the mantle layer is made of pyroxenes and stuff like that, and then the outer core is liquid iron, and the inner core is uh, solid nickel iron. And you should know about how we know what the interior of the Earth is like from looking at those seismic layer, uh, seismic data, passing um, sound waves through the Earth and looking at how they bend and timing how long it takes for them to arrive, all that kind of stuff. Then we gave you lots of evidence for the idea that the continents move around for continental drift and presented the theory of plate tectonics so you should understand how plate tectonics works and how it explains the surface features of the Earth and what kinds of things go on at the different types of plate boundaries within the Earth. So talk about relative ages of the rocks. Remember there are these five principles. The principle of original horizontality. That's the idea that sedimentary rock is laid down in horizontal layers originally. And if you see layers of, of sedimentary rock that aren't horizontal, then something had to have happened after they were deposited to cause them to tip like that. The principle of superposition is a fancy way of saying the oldest stuff is on the bottom and it gets younger as you go up. Of course, that's assuming that nothing's happened to flip the layers over. So there are exceptions to all of these rules. 
Um, the principle of cross-cutting relationships says that when you have a layer of rock that is completely cut across by another layer of rock or by a crack or something of that nature, the material that cross-cuts has to be younger than the material it's cutting across. The principle of inclusion says that if you have one type of rock that's completely surrounded by or included within another, the included rock has to be older than the rock that is surrounding it. And then finally, the principle of faunal succession, succession says you can look at the fossils in the rocks. They kind of go in a certain order from less complex to more complex, and you can use that to put the rocks in the right order as well. We talked about how you measure the absolute ages of rocks. And uh, we use the decay of radioactive isotopes to do that. Keep in mind that radioactive clocks don't work linearly. That is, the sand doesn't run out of the clock at a constant rate so that you wait a certain amount of time of half of it's gone, and you wait the same amount of time again, then it's completely gone. Instead, isotopic clocks are exponential, which means that if you start with a certain amount of radioactive isotope and you wait long enough for half of it to decay, and then you wait that same amount of time again, it's not all gone. It's half of the re remaining material is gone, or in other words, you have a fourth of it after two of those half-life periods. And if you wait the same amount of time again, then half of the one-fourth disappears. So you have one-eighth of the original amount left. And then you wait the same amount of time again, Half of that's gone, so you have one sixteenth of the original amount left, and so on. So if you keep that in mind, you won't have any trouble with the way isotopic clocks work. Um, we saw that the Earth has certain major features. Of course, the, the biggest features are the continents and the ocean basins, which are shown on this map. Um, the continents are made of granitic-type rock, that's less dense, that floats higher um, in the mantle. And the ocean basins are made of more dense basaltic type rock that sinks down deeper. If we look closer at the continents, uh, we see that often their margin goes way out into the ocean, so the real boundary of the continent is the continental shelf out here. We see that many of the continents have mountain ranges along their edge. Uh, North and South America being one of the best examples of that. We call those mountain ranges fold mountain belts. Uh, the oldest rocks on the continents are in what's called the Continental Shield, which would be in northern Canada in North America. And large parts of the continents are, are covered with uh, what's called stable platform, which is just thick layers of, of horizontally deposited rock like what we see in the Midwestern United States. Um, then we can look at the ocean basins. We see that many of the ocean basins have mountain ranges underwater that are running right down the middle. And you can't see it on the scale of this map, but at the center of those mountain ranges often you see uh, a rift, a valley, right on in the top of that mountain range. Um, we see that in some places in the ocean basins there are deep trenches and the trenches tend to be right along island arcs, uh, like in the Philippines here, or along off the coast of Japan. Or sometimes those trenches are right next to the continent, like here along the west coast of uh, South America. And so you've got these deep trenches and these mountain ranges, and in between there are just plains of deep material with a lot of sediment on the bottom. And what we see is that the theory of plate tectonics allows us to explain uh, all these various features. Now uh, this summarizes plate tectonics. I haven't really talked about the evidence for plate tectonics. You should carefully review that uh, from the chapter on plate tectonics. You know, the jigsaw fit of the continents and the matchup of rocks rock types across the oceans and the matchup of fossil types across the oceans and all that kind of stuff. But uh, what's illustrated on this slide is how plate tectonics works and uh, some of the things that it explains. And so I'll just kind of work across it from left to right. So plate tectonics says that the surface of the earth is divided up into these plates of cold lithospheric rock that float on top of 
a deformable, plasticky, partially liquid asthenosphere underneath. And uh, where the plates come together is where a lot of interesting things happen. So for example, you might have a plate of oceanic basaltic rock colliding with another plate of oceanic basaltic rock, like what's happening over here. One of the plates will be pushed underneath or subducted underneath the other one. And of course the one that goes underneath gets pushed down and it melts. It's rock that's saturated with water. When you have water in the rock that makes it easier to melt. So as that gets pushed down it melted, it, or it melts and magma rises as a result of that. The magma comes up and forms volcanoes. Uh, so you get a, vo a volcanic island chain along the plate boundary. But where the two plates are coming together, where the one dives underneath the other one, that produces the deep trenches that we see in the seabed. And remember, plate tectonics is good at predicting um, the severity and the depth of earthquakes. Well, in this case, we have two plates colliding, and both of them are cold, brittle rock. And so you would expect large stresses to build up at the plate collision here, and therefore you should get pretty severe earthquakes at this kind of boundary. And the depth of the earthquakes will increase as you move away from the, the trench and go deeper and deeper where those two come together. I'm going to turn my mouse on so it stays on all the time. There we go. Um, but anyway, the melting of the plate as it's pushed back down into the mantle causes magma to rise and forms these island arcs like the Philippines and Japan. Um, some interesting things happen away from the plate boundaries, and an example of that is the Hawaiian Islands, where there's a hot spot or rising mantle material underneath that comes up and burns through the plate and creates a big volcano, a shield volcano, like on the big island of Hawaii today. And uh, what happens is the plate moves over top of the hot spot, and so it burns through in different places. And where it's moved off and it's no longer uh, putting up magma, uh, those islands sink back down into the mantle and eventually end up as seamounts underneath. And that's exactly what's happening in the Hawaiian Islands. The only active volcano is Hawaii. And then as you go up to the northwest, uh, the islands get older and smaller and eventually go underwater. OK, another type of plate boundary is what we call a diverging plate boundary, as you see here, uh, under the seabed. So what's happening there is you have mantle material coming up from underneath and flowing away from the junction. That pulls the plates apart. And where they're pulled apart, you get magma coming to the surface, forming that mid-ocean ridge mountain range with a little trench right in the middle of it. And uh, so you get a lot of volcanic activity at these kind of boundaries. But uh, the plates are warm there. The, the, the rocks are sort of soft, and so you don't build up really large stresses. You get lots of earthquakes, but they tend to be not very severe. And notice that where the plates separate, they don't always separate cleanly. You get places where the plates are sliding with respect to each other. Those are transform boundaries, and they produce earthquakes also. Um, and if they're far from the place where the spreading is happening, the earthquakes can be severe. But in either case, earthquakes of this type tend to be fairly shallow. Let's move over a little further to where we have an oceanic plate being pushed underneath a continental plate. Of course, that's what should happen because the oceanic crust is more dense. It's basaltic rock, and the granitic, less dense rock of the continent should ride on top. Once again, as the oceanic plate's pushed underneath, you get a deep trench at the plate boundary, which is what happens off the coast of South America, where the Nazca plate is getting pushed underneath the South American plate. And as that oceanic plate goes down and carries a lot of water with it, uh, it melts easily. And that molten magma comes up and forms volcanoes all along the boundary. And also, as this oceanic plate pushes under the continental plate, it pushes the continental plate up. And that's why you get fold mountain belts right along the boundary with lots of volcanoes in them. What kind of earthquakes do you get at this kind of boundary? Well, the oceanic plate is cold and brittle, and the continental plate is cold and brittle, so you'd expect severe earthquakes of varying depths as, you, as one plate pushes underneath the other one. 
One more type of plate boundary. That's where you have two continental plates pull, pulling apart. For the same reason that the oceanic plates pull apart, there's a mantle plume underneath that's causing the plates to separate, so they break apart. You get volcanic activity in the rift zone, just like you do underneath the ocean. Um, but on the land, it tends to sink when that happens. Um, as the, as the two continental plates pull apart and you fill it in with more dense material coming up from underneath and so it sinks and eventually you get new ocean created there what, which is what's happening at the Red Sea and um, in the Great Rift Valleys of Africa. So this process of, of plate tectonics explains all the major surface features of the earth. It's really a beautiful theory. It's interesting to think about whether plate tectonics has happened anywhere besides on the Earth, and it ties in with what we talked about from planetary science. So two places where you might expect it would have happened would be Mars, which is a planet you know, only a little bit smaller than the Earth. When we look at Mars, we see shield volcanoes, big volcanoes like uh, the Hawaiian Islands that mark where we think hot spots used to be. But What's different on Mars is there's no plate motion, so the hot spot stays in the same place relative to the plate, and you just get more and more coming out, and bigger and bigger volcanoes, so you get these huge volcanoes on, on Mars that poke all the way up out into space. Why didn't Mars have plate tectonics? Well, it's a smaller planet than the Earth, so it probably cooled down quicker than the Earth, and maybe it cooled too quickly to have that plasticky asthenosphere layer underneath that allows the plates to move. In addition, Mars doesn't have as much water as the Earth has. It had more in the past than it has now, but maybe it never had enough to form those hydrated minerals that you need to have that melt easily that allow the tectonic plates to move around. Well, what about Venus? Venus is about the same size as the Earth, so you'd expect it to behave like the Earth. Um, the problem with Venus is we couldn't see the surface until pretty recently because of the thick atmospheric clouds. But now it's all been mapped in radar. If you look at radar maps, we can see that there are lots of volcanoes all over the surface of Venus, but there aren't any hotspot trails. So once again, it looks like there was no plate tectonics ever on Venus. Why didn't it happen there? Well, we think maybe it's because the planet is so hot that you can't form those hydrated minerals that you have to have to have plate tectonics and perhaps there was never enough water on Venus to form the hydrated minerals. So in that sense Earth is unique and uh, maybe the fact that we have a plate tectonic system has something to do with why life developed on Earth and probably not on Venus and well we don't know about Mars. So why don't we see plate tectonic features elsewhere? We really don't know but it's kinda cool that it happened on Earth. Okay, going on in geology, we talked about different major types of rocks and how they're tied in with each, with each other. I'll go into more detail about that. Uh, the rock cycle is how they're tied into each other. We'll talk about that a little bit. We talked about the hydrological system, about how water um, is stored in the oceans and is lifted by solar radiation up into the atmosphere and then it precipitates and runs back down and erodes the rocks from the land and it can precipitate as ice and make glaciers and cause erosion. I won't really talk about that any more than I'm talking about right here. So go back and look at the PowerPoints from that chapter to review it. Uh, we talked about the Earth's climate and what its temperature history is and talked about whether it's likely that the Earth is getting warmer and, and whether humans are causing it. I'll talk about that more. We'll talk about, we talked about the planets of the solar system. We saw there were three kinds, uh, terrestrial rocky planets, uh, gas giant Jovian planets, and icy bodies like Pluto. We'll talk about those and what that has to do with the, the theory of the way the solar system formed. Um, we talked then about stars. We talked about what kind of stars live the longest and in what stage of their life they stay the longest. They stay in the main sequence, stable, mature star phase for almost all of their lives, just like humans are in the mature adult phase for most of their lives. Well, we'll touch on most of this in more detail here in a second. So here's the rock cycle. Remember, there are three primary types of rocks. 
Igneous rocks are rocks that form from molten magma, and they include things like granite and basalt and pumice uh, and obsidian. All of those are rocks that uh, form from the melt. You can tell igneous rocks because they tend to have crystals in them, and the size of the crystals is related to how quickly they cooled. If they cool very quickly, there's not time to form big crystals. If they cool very slowly deep underground, then you can grow giant crystals. So just looking at the crystals tells you something about the temperature history of igneous rocks. All rocks on Earth were originally igneous rocks. But of course, once you've got the solid rocks, and you let them be subject to rain and weathering and erosion, uh, they become sediment that's carried by, um, by water or wind, and that sediment can get dumped uh, and form a new kind of rock once it's compacted and cemented together, and that's called sedimentary rocks. So sedimentary rocks are formed from uh, water or wind dumping them. And uh, sedimentary rocks, of course, can be weathered and eroded, and form other kinds of sedimentary rocks, or sedimentary rocks can be subjected to high temperatures and or pressures, which transforms them chemically into metamorphic rocks. So the characteristic of sedimentary rocks is you see little grains like sand or pebbles or, well, different size grains depending on what kind of sediment it was. But if you heat it up and put it under pressure, well, you don't see that grainy stuff anymore. Instead, you see weird stripes and interesting shapes that show that that rock's been tortured by high temperature and pressure. That's metamorphic rock. And a metamorphic rock can be eroded and weathered and become sediment, or um, it can be melted to become magma, and then that can cool and become igneous rock. And of course, you can also go directly from igneous rock subjecting it to high temperature and pressure but not hot enough to melt it, and that can convert igneous rock into metamorphic rock. So let's see, sedimentary rock examples of that are sandstone and mudstone and limestone and shale. Metamorphic rocks are things like um, marble and uh, nis and schist, ones with sort of interesting names. Uh, let's see, we already talked about how water affects the melting temperatures of rocks. Basically, if you get water into the rock, then you get new chemistry that basically makes it easier for the rock to melt, or in other words, uh, the melting temperature gets lower. And uh, there's, this has even been in the news fairly recently, where people have taken sound waves and bounced them down into the earth, and there's evidence that there's some partial melting uh, down about 250 miles, which would happen when the water gets down there and mixes with the olivine-type rocks and the, um, the stuff that's normally making up the mantle and makes a new mineral called ringwoodite that melts more easily. We talked about the climate history of the Earth, and we saw that a lot of what we know about this comes from ice cores that have been drilled in Antarctica, and then you analyze the gas that's in the bubbles in that ice, and you can do other chemical tests that tell you what the average temperatures were back in those days. It's not just those ice cores, but it's easiest to see the data from this. And uh, what's shown here is two graphs. The top one shows carbon dioxide concentration uh, in the ice cores versus how long ago it was. And the bottom one shows what the average temperature change was uh, in those times relative to the present. So if you define the present to be zero in 1950, then uh, you see it going up and down. The important thing to notice here is that there's a pretty strong correlation between carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and temperature change. In fact, all the little wiggles and bumps in these graphs, or at least most of them, tend to line up, which suggests that if you put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the temperature goes up. And um, one other interesting thing to note, um, the axis here on the carbon dioxide concentration runs from 160 parts per million to 300, and you couldn't put the, the carbon dioxide concentration on the Earth today on this graph because right now it'd be way up here. It's about 400 parts per million. So we've got a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and um, 
we also see that the Earth is getting warmer. Um, there's no debate among scientists about whether it's getting warmer. It definitely is. The only little bit of debate is about what causes it. And you might think that it's some natural cycle causing it, but we pretty much ruled that out. It's almost certainly due to human causes. Um, one thing that does cause changes in the temperature is the amount of solar radiation that gets the Earth that, that the Earth receives from the Sun, and we understand that pretty well because we understand how the Earth's orbit changes over time. Uh, for instance, the circularity or the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit varies from fairly elliptical to very circular on a cycle of every hundred thousand years. It cycles back and forth from an ellipse to a circle and that changes the average temperature. Another thing that happens is the Earth's rotational axis changes its angle with respect to the orbital axis. It varies from 24 and a half degrees to 21 and a half degrees. Right now it's 23 and a half, but that tilting back and forth of the axis uh, cycles every 41,000 years. And uh, of course, if it's tipped more towards the to the sun, you get more severe summers, and if it's tipped away, you don't. Um, the other thing the axis does is it wobbles around in space as the Earth is orbiting, and that goes on a 23,000 year cycle. Um, so if you put all the, these three together, you can calculate how much solar radiation uh, is falling on the Earth and what the average temperature ought to be. And according to those cycles, we should be going into a new ice age right now. We should be getting cooler. But instead, what's really happening is uh, we're getting considerably warmer. One other way to see this is by uh, looking at methane levels in the atmosphere, again from ice core data. The level of methane in the atmosphere correlates very well with temperature. So What's shown here is a little bit of a complex graph. The amount of solar radiation that you calculate from those orbital patterns that were on the last slide uh, is shown in the uh, yellow-orange curve, just going up and down. Of course, there are several cycles superimposed on each other, so that's why it wiggles the way it wiggles. And then the amount of methane in the atmosphere from the ice cores is plotted in blue relative to this right-hand axis. And what you see is that you know, when the Earth is warmer, the methane levels go high, and when the Earth is cooler, they go down, and it cycles up and down, and these things sort of trace each other pretty nicely until, oh, six or 8,000 years ago when suddenly uh, the solar radiation levels went down making, so the Earth should have gotten cooler, but instead got warmer. And we speculate that this might correspond to the beginning of human agriculture on the Earth. So we may have been affecting the climate for a really long time, but things didn't get super out of whack until we started to burn a lot of fossil fuel and dump huge amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And now things are moving quite a bit faster. Well, enough about that. We left the Earth and we looked at the solar system, and you know I like this stuff, so I talk about it a lot. But there are three kinds of planets in the solar system. There are the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the terrestrials. They're rocky planets. They're high density. They don't have much atmosphere. Then if you go further out, you get Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And these planets are all low density, huge worlds. Um, that are gas giants, gaseous surfaces, really thick atmospheres. And if you go out past Neptune, then you get a bunch of little dinky icy bodies like Pluto and Sedna, and there are three or four, well, there are a bunch of others out there. Um, we haven't discovered them all. But these have intermediate densities in their little ice cubes, and their atmospheres depend on how close they are to the sun. So sometimes they're frozen solid. Let's focus on the first couple of kinds for just a second. So the terrestrial planets, like Earth, are the ones that are closest to the Sun. They have low total mass because they're not very big planets, but they have high densities. And in fact, the density kind of goes highest density 
close to the planet or close to the sun and then the density falls as you move further out. So 3.9 to 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. You can compare that to one gram per cubic centimeter for water and eight grams per cubic centimeter for iron. So we're kind of in between there. These are layered planets. Uh, we think they have iron cores at their center that are surrounded by silicate rock silicate uh, crust and mantle. The mantle is made of peridotite, olivine, that kind of stuff. The crust is made of granite and basalt. Um, some of these planets have atmospheres. Venus has a really nice atmosphere, well really nasty atmosphere, very thick. Uh, Earth has a, a nice one. Um, Mars and Mercury not so much. All of these planets except the Earth are very highly cratered and of course the reason the Earth isn't highly cratered is because the Earth's surface gets reworked by the hydrological cycle and by the action of the atmosphere uh, on the Earth's surface. So it all gets weathered away. But all the others have got impact craters. Um, not too many moons for these planets. Uh, the Earth having one big moon, Mars having two little dinky captured asteroids and no others. But if we go out and look at the gas giants, Jupiter being the poster child for them, they're further from the Sun. Uh, they have a lot of total mass. They're big planets, but their densities are low, uh, 0.7 to 1.6 grams per cubic centimeter. They are layered planets too. We think they have uh, at least silicate rock at the center, maybe an iron core. And then as you go out, there's an ice layer around that, frozen water, methane, and frozen nitrogen. Outside that, there's probably a liquid layer, liquid hydrogen, liquid helium. This is all based on what we understand of the chemistry of those materials. We haven't actually been down to sample any of this. And then the outermost layer we can sample, that's gas. It's hydrogen and helium primarily. And these planets have lots of moons, and some of those moons are worlds unto themselves. Uh, most of them have an outer layer of ice, with one exception, that's Io, probably not Titan. Uh, but they're pretty interesting places, so well, I won't dwell on them too much. Let's see. It is important to know that the, the temperature and the density of material around a star as it forms determines what kind of planets form. So this is the theory that corresponds with and, and explains why we get the kind of planets we get. So when a star is forming, near the star in close, the temperatures are pretty high. In fact, the temperatures are too high for ices to form. And so if you can't form ices, you can't get a lot of mass together easily. The only way you get it together is from gravity. And uh, that means that the light elements like hydrogen get driven off by the heat of the star. So what you're left with is heavy stuff like iron and silicon and oxygen and aluminum and carbon. And it's that stuff that forms these dense terrestrial type planets. So that's why the densities of the terrestrial planets are high. If you go out further from the star, the temperatures fall. And if you get out far enough, you get past what's called the snow line. And if you're further out than the snow line, then you form ice. And that ice can condense into very large bodies very quickly. And so you get big masses of material that have a lot of gravity that can attract the hydrogen and the helium and hang on to it. And the hydrogen and helium are not getting driven away as hard because the temperature is not as high. And so you get these big gas giants at intermediate distances. At large distances, the temperature is pretty cold, all right. So you can, can, can make ice, but there's not very much material. And so you get icy objects, but they're not very big. And we think that there are lots of them out there. They're just hard to see. Other important ideas. We talked about stars and the life history of stars and how that varies according to their mass. What is it that makes a regular star? Well, a regular star is one where there's fusion, hydrogen fusion going on that's in balance with the gravitational collapse. And Stars spend most of their lives in that state on what's called the main sequence. Uh, we talked a lot about how to find distances in space, and that's pretty important, so make sure you review that. How you find distances to the planets, to the stars, and to the galaxies, and I'll review that in a bit. Uh, we'll talk about the evidence that supports the idea of the Big Bang Theory, and uh, we'll finally talk about um, 
cosmological redshift and the fact that the whole universe is expanding. So how do you find distances to objects in space? Well, if you're within the solar system, you can bounce a laser beam off or bounce a radar signal off. You know that that electromagnetic radiation goes at the speed of light. So if you know the speed and you time how long it takes for the echo to come back, if you know the speed and the time, it's easy to calculate the distance. And that's a very precise way to measure distances. But it only works for things that are close, that is, within our own solar system. For things that are the distance of stars, you can't use that method. And instead, what we use is triangulation, which is just trigonometry, or it's also called stellar parallax. Stellar parallax meaning the angle that is uh, that the stars appear to shift back and forth. Remember when we did this with our thumb and looked with both eyes at our thumb and saw it jump back and forth? Um, that triangulation method works out to about distances of 3,000 light years. And all it involves is solving a triangle. So you measure the direction to the star uh, at one time, and then you wait six months, which means the Earth has moved to the opposite side of its orbit, and then measure the direction to the star then. And from those two directions, you can figure out the angle, and you know the distance of the baseline, that's the diameter of the Earth's orbit, so from that you can calculate how far away the stars are. And that's pretty accurate, and so that's used for nearby stars. Can't work for things further away than about 3,000 light years because the angles get too small to measure. So for things that are further out than that, we use what's called the brightness-distance relationship. And uh, there are several versions or flavors of this that depend on what we're trying to measure the brightness of. So if we're looking at main sequence stars, um, we can measure distances to stars within our own galaxy that way. And remember, to use this method, you have to know how bright the star really is. And we can get that from its color. So a red star is dim, and a blue star is intrinsically bright. And then we look in the sky at how bright they actually look. So you might have a red star that looks really bright because it's close. And you might have a blue star that looks really dim, but it looks dim because it's far away. And from the mathematical relationship called the inverse square law, you can calculate the distances to those stars. It's not as exact as triangulation. And in fact, what we do for nearby stars is we measure them both with brightness distance and with triangulation. And we use the triangulation method to calibrate the brightness distance method. Um, if you're further away, then you can't see main sequence stars. They're not bright enough. You have to use something brighter. And what's used is a big bright star called a Cepheid variable, which pulses. So it gets brighter and dimmer. Um, a famous star that's one of this type is, is the pole star, Polaris. It doesn't change by enough that you can uh, easily see it with the naked eye. But if you're using sensitive instruments, you can measure it. Anyway, these are big, bright stars, so you can see them in nearby galaxies. And it's easy to measure their pulsations. And there's a relationship between how fast they pulse and how bright they really are. So that tells you how bright they really are. And then you measure how bright they look. And making that comparison, you can calculate how far away they are. And that works for stars in nearby. So you measure the distances to nearby galaxies that way. If things are further away, more distant galaxies, then you need something brighter than a Cepheid variable to be able to see it at all. And what we use for them is supernovas, that is, dying star explosions. Sometimes a supernova, that star can be as bright as all the other stars in its galaxy put together at the same time. And certain types of supernovas have pretty well characterized brightnesses. A type 1a supernova, we know how bright that gets. And so if we look at that star and see how bright it looks, compare that with how bright it really is, we can calculate the distance to very distant galaxies.
And then there's one other trick for measuring distances, and that uses cosmological redshift. So if we look out at distant objects, far away galaxies, we see that all of them are moving away from us. We can tell that from the Doppler shift in the light that's coming from them and, and being seen on the Earth. The fact that they're moving away means the wavelengths are shifted, uh, they're stretched longer, which means the light looks redder. And you can measure how red it is, and what we see is that the farther away something is, the greater the redshift is. And that relationship is called the Hubble Law. And so if you measure how much redshift there is, you can determine how far away that object is. And that's what's used to measure the distances to the very most distant objects. This little diagram uh, illustrates the life history of a star. And so this is important because it ties together a lot of the ideas that we've talked about earlier in the class. So stars start out as clouds of gas and dust, and something causes some of that dust to start collapsing gravitationally. A uh, shock wave from a, a supernova explosion, for example. But anyway, all matter is attracted to other matter by gravity, so it starts to fall together, and you convert gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy, which is converted into heat, and so it starts to heat up as it collapses. And you form at the center of that collapsing cloud of gas something called a protostar. The protostar gets hot, but it's not fusing hydrogen to helium yet. It's only hot because you're converting gravitational potential energy into heat. Now, what happens to it depends on how much mass you have. If you don't have very much mass, then you never start nuclear fusion because it doesn't get hot enough, and it becomes a brown dwarf, and that's the end of the story. But if you have enough material, then it gets hot enough at the core as you convert potential energy into kinetic energy into heat, that you start doing nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium in the core of the star. At that point, you have something pushing out that can balance the gravity pulling in, and you form a mature star. And the lifetime of the mature star depends on how much matter you have. Interestingly, it kind of goes counter to intuit. In, uh, counter to intuition. You would expect that if you have a lot of matter that that star would probably last for a long time because it's got lots of fuel to burn. But that's exactly the opposite of the truth. What really happens is if you have a lot of matter and it comes together, the core of the star gets really hot and the rate of nuclear fusion gets very fast and it burns through all its fuel very quickly and that kind of star might only last for a few million years. But if you have just a little bit of matter, just enough to get fusion started, and you form a cool red star, a red dwarf, a red dwarf star might last a trillion years because it doesn't burn through the little fuel that it's got very quickly. Anyway, the star spends most of its life in that mature phase, which is called main sequence. And uh, then when it runs out of hydrogen fuel in the core, interesting things start to happen. And uh, what happens is the core starts to collapse again because there's not any pressure from fusion pushing out anymore. So it collapses and heats up. The core gets hotter, and the outer layers of the, car of the star expand and cool because of that, and it forms what's called a red giant. So it's red, it's got a cool surface, but it's a pretty bright star because it's really big because of this gas that's blown out from the surface. Um, and then what happens again depends on the mass. If it's a star like our sun, the outer layers of the star eventually get blown off in these rings of gas and uh, forms what's called a planetary nebula. What's left at the center is a white dwarf star, and uh, it's pretty hot and very small, but there's, it runs out of fuel and eventually cools off, becomes a black, a black dwarf, and that's the end of it. If the star's more massive, though, then the core heats up and it can get hot enough that it starts to fuse other things. So it can fuse, starts with hydrogen to helium, but then it can fuse helium and then it can fuse uh, nitrogen and oxygen and other heavier elements, do higher and higher energy fusion reactions and get hotter and hotter at the core as it continues to collapse. And um, eventually you fuse all the way up to the element iron. Remember, iron is special. 
because you can't fuse iron and release energy. It costs energy to fuse iron. Any element lighter than iron, fusion releases energy, but from iron heavier, uh, it costs energy. So once you get to iron, you're in trouble because now there's nothing to resist the gravitational collapse anymore, and the whole star then collapses in one catastrophic event. And as that material comes in and hits, uh, it rebounds, it creates extremely high temperatures and pressures at the center of the explosion, and it costs energy to do fusion, but you can fuse iron and heavier elements in that case, and that's how all the heavier elements get created. Of course, it collapses to the center, and then it rebounds, and the whole star explodes, and uh, that's called a supernova explosion. We talked about those already. Uh, supernovas can be brighter than the whole galaxy that they're in uh, for a period of a few weeks. Um, what happens after the supernova, again, depends on the mass. There's a little bit of stuff left over in the center sometimes, and that's, that forms what's called a neutron star if the mass isn't very high. Uh, that's where you have gravity compressing uh, electrons into protons to form neutrons. It's really dense material. If it's spinning, it forms a pulsar. Uh, but if you have more matter, then there's nothing that can stop the collapse. Not even the nuclear forces in a neutron star are enough. And so it collapses completely and forms a black hole where all the rules of physics uh, go out the window and we don't really know what happens. But we have lots of observational evidence that black holes really exist. And we think that there are supermassive black holes at the center of nearly every galaxy. The theories that try to explain the whole universe and where it all came from are called cosmological theories, and there are certain things that every good cosmological theory has to explain. For instance, it has to explain the fact that the, the universe is expanding, that everything we see out at large distances is redshifted because it's moving away from us. So we need an explanation for that. It has to explain the cosmic microwave background radiation. That is a faint glow of energy uh, at an absolute temperature of three degrees above absolute zero. It's microwave radiation that we see out in space in every direction everywhere we look. Uh, it needs to explain the relative abundance of hydrogen, abundances of hydrogen and helium in the universe. 75% hydrogen, about 25% helium, with traces of everything else. And it needs to explain why the matter and energy that we see in the universe today is the way it is. I mean, why do we have galaxies? Why do we have galactic clusters? And it turns out there's really only one good explanation for this, that has been that stood the test of time, and that's the Big Bang theory. Uh, interesting TV show, but even more interesting um, cosmological theory. So there's lots of evidence in support of this Big Bang idea. For instance, well, the Big Bang theory says that about 14 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe and all the energy in the universe was in a tiny very dense singularity, and 14 billion years ago it started to expand or explode. And it's been expanding ever since, and so the fact that you've got this exploding singularity means that uh, that's why we see the expansion and the cosmological redshift we see today. It also explains that cosmic microwave background radiation that was discovered by Penzias and Wilson, the two Bell Labs engineers, uh, who were trying to get rid of microwave noise, um, that cosmic microwave background is essentially the faint glow from the explosion from 14 billion years ago that has been uh, uh, cosmologically redshifted so that it's now all the way down in the microwave. Uh, it's very uniform across space. We saw this map uh, that is a, a map of the intensity of the cosmic microwave background where uh, intense places are red and low intensity places are black. But the difference between the hottest and the coldest here is only a little fraction of a degree. It's very flat across space. And the Big Bang Theory explains that pretty well. It also explains the relative abundance of hydrogen and helium and lithium in the universe. Uh, early in the Big Bang, you would have got hydrogen fusion to produce about the amount of helium that we see and lithium that we see um, in the universe today.
All the other elements are made either by fusion in stars up to iron or by supernova explosions when stars die. And that pretty much explains everything. Well, I hope that this review has been some help to you. I would encourage you to go back and look at the PowerPoints for the individual chapters and kind of review that material too. I've tried to touch on the stuff I think is the most important, but I wish you luck as you go to take this exam and hope that you'll do your very best. And I uh, look forward to seeing you in class just uh, another time or two. Thanks.